we're going to jump to chapter 18. Uh, the reason that we're jumping to chapter 18 is so you kind of get <clears throat> some uh, front end information, a little bit understanding of buckling, uh, because the, <clears throat> the project that we're going to do uh, this semester is with a tower. So it'll include, I mean, it's an exercise in, in uh, buckling and stability more than the bridge, which was, um, I mean, I guess the truss forces, tension compression in, in the truss. This one probably will also be a truss. Uh, you're supposed to build it out of some sort of wood. It's pretty open. I, I kind of changed the problem. You'll have to read the problem. It's online. Because uh, I changed it from years past a little bit in that I opened it up that you can use, I don't know, it probably doesn't make any difference. You can use any wood you want. Like, okay, it probably doesn't, you're going to end up using basswood or balsa wood. Balsa wood's actually more efficient if you get the right balsa wood. Um, what else do we change with it? You're, the idea is that you, you build a, you've probably seen these, a tower that holds, instead of the, the bricks being laid on like the bridge, the bricks are all stacked on top of the tower. So problem one is you have to somehow uh, anticipate holding those, those bricks, the steel bricks. Uh, it has to be sturdy enough at the top. Uh, we used to actually have, I mean, include in the design a plate that would hold the bricks, but I didn't, I didn't bother to write that into it. it. But somehow you have to think about how those bricks are going to be supported at the top. They all get stacked up. Look at the, the equation for how it's rated is not just the maximum load. The, the maximum load carried is part of it, but also uh, there's, a, there's a maximum weight, which is pretty low, four ounces. And if you go below that, there's some uh, little increase in, in the value of it. So going lighter is a little better. But the biggest increase is to go higher. It's actually factored twice. You know, double the score for going high, higher as opposed to adding double the weight. Uh, so the idea is to try to build it up high. But of course, the higher you go, you're still you only you have a limited amount of material, so you're stretching it thinner and thinner. So there is obviously a limit, which is probably about this high, that uh, you, you can only stretch four ounces so far, and and it becomes so thin that it won't hold anything. Uh, and you do have to hold a, lim a minimum of 25 pounds, so that's five of those bricks, and stretch it at least, I think the minimum height's 40 inches or something. It's about, about like that. So this high, 25 pounds and four ounces. And the higher you can go, the better. The more weight you carry, the better. The lighter, the better. So you can, you can start to think of that. Um, it, it involves stability in two ways. Uh, one, it will look at today the buckling of individual members and also the buckling of the, the tower as a whole. I mean, the, the stability of it. Uh, right. Which, <laughs> it might fall over, right? Okay. Which I guess the bridges weren't quite as likely to do. Anyway, so have a look at that. And there, it, it runs in similar um, fashion to the, the, the one we did with the bridges. I mean, there's a preliminary. You should work out a preliminary design. And that has some upcoming due date. I'm not sure when. Well, that's a, you know, just a simple page submission or something. It's not too complex. And then there's um, the testing and then a final report. So. You can start to have a look at that, would be a good idea. Now, here you can turn these down. So, concerning columns, look at that. There's our beautiful column, huh? Uh, columns deal with uh, an aspect of, of uh, design that we've not really looked at as of yet, and that is stability. Remember, we talked about the, the three S's. Uh, strength, stability, serviceability. Uh, 
So far, we've dealt mainly with strength. P over A, MC over I, those are, those are stress equations that are geared at uh, finding an, uh, the level of strength <clears throat> in terms of stress and comparing it maybe to uh, an allowable level of stress. But they don't say anything about uh, stability, about whether the thing falls over. Uh, usually, stability is, is looked at as compared to, um, if I do this right, um, as compared to what a ball might do on, on a curved surface. If you have a, um, if you imagine a little, a little bit of a curved surface and a marble sitting on it or a ball, um, either one of those, it may remain a stable and, and sit there. I mean, if you, if you do it just right, you could probably get the thing to sit there. Obviously, this one's pretty easy to get to sit there. But, but this one is stable, and this one's not. <laughs> and the, the definition has to do with if you, if you give it a small force and you push it, and it, it, it would move, it would eventually come come back. You know, you could you could give this one a nudge and it would go, and it would it would return. If you give this one a nudge, it's just going to keep going. It's not going to come back, right? So, so that's a that's a problem with with uh, stability. If you have a, a condition that's um, that that can flex and come back, a beam is is usually, you know, you'll deflect it and it'll come back. A column uh, will deflect and come back as well. But there's some critical point uh, where it, whoops, where it, where it doesn't come back. That one's not going to come back. <laughs> um, and the whole thing collapses. Uh, with a, with a, uh, a column, <laughs> I won't break this one. Uh, as you, as you load it, there's a, it, it initially deflects under any load. It has a little bit of a deflection. Uh, but there's a, an additional twisting force that you're inducing as it, as it deflects. Because as it deflects, the column's over here and the load's over here. So there's an eccentricity suddenly. It's as if you're loading it. If I had a... You know, if I had a, uh, a column and I loaded it from the side, it would definitely bend, you know, because I'm loading it all from this side, right? It's going to bend it that way. If I load it uh, from the other side, it bends the other way. Well, and then it can control it. See, if you load it in the center, well, then it's actually not so likely to deflect either way. But at some point, it does uh, deflect, probably irregularities in the the material or something, as soon as it starts to deflect, then, then there's this uh, additional moment that's on it because of this force is acting over a, a distance. The force times the distance is causing a twist. So actually, the fact that it's like that is twisting it more. This, if I could keep it straight, this would hold much more than if I, if I initially put a crook in it, then it doesn't hold very much at all. So as soon as it as soon as it goes beyond a certain point, it, it progressively fails. You know, when I do, to, as demonstration, I can do this. Well, actually, what I'm doing, you can hardly tell this, but as soon as it buckles, I relieve some of the force. I'm backing off with my hand. Just, just sort of a natural ability of mine that I'm able to, to regulate the <laughs> amount of bend in this column. But if this were just a dead weight on it, if I put a, a, a few bricks up here, as soon as it does this, they're just going to keep going. So they're, they're more likely to behave like this. As soon as it, as soon as it goes beyond a certain point that it, it's, it's failing, so that's, a, that's an instability as soon as it, as it starts to buckle. And buckle is a, buckling is a stability factor. Beams also have a stability uh, mode or an instability mode, and that's is they, they buckle sideways. 
uh, if you imagine the top flange in compression, right? It's tops in compression, right? And the bottom flange in, is in tension. When I, when I start to load it, then this top part acts as a beam, and the bottom part is a, is a tensile cord, so that the top part actually buckles in, in compression. You know, it, it'll want to flip out sideways like that. Whoa, whoa, wow. Marvelous. Uh, that's lateral, lateral buckling, and it also twists, so it's usually lateral torsional buckling. It twists because it's, it's held by the, the flange to the bottom one, so it, it rotates around that in torsion. Well, the, the, uh, the fellow who, who developed buckling theory uh, is one of the most congenial uh, people in all history of, of structure it's mathematics. I mean, most people that are really great are really snobby. <laughs> I mean, at least a few I've known that are really great are not really the sort of people you'd like to have, you know, pal around with much, but Euler seems to have been the most incredibly nice guy that ever walked the planet. He actually died laughing. <laughs> he was playing with his, if I had this story right, he was playing with his granddaughter and, and laughing away and had some sort of a stroke. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, uh, amazing. And um, he was, he's a Swiss fellow. Uh, his, uh, came from a, a family, I guess his father was a, a pastor and thought he should be a pastor. Uh, but they knew the Bernoullis, the Bernoulli family, uh, is the father Joseph? I'm not really sure. The brothers are very famous, uh, uh, Nick and Dan Bernoulli, and uh, he was friends with them. He's contemporary with them. They were like his buddies, and he went to, he got, you know, Saturday afternoon tutoring from their dad, and they quickly figured out that he was pretty much a genius, so they, they pushed him in the direction of studying math, and uh, he went on to Paris, got his doctorate in like a year and a half, and, and just really was a phenomenal guy. He, he, um, he's very well known for a lot of things, not, not so much. This was the, the buckling equation for which, in, in terms of engineering, he is forever uh, uh, remembered. Um, he wrote that, that was not really his interest. He wrote that off like on the back of an envelope to the answer of some, somebody that said, hey, it would be nice if we could figure this out. And he said, yeah, that's really no problem. Blah, 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 blah. Here, it's something like this. And you know, like in 15 minutes, solved the problem um, that nobody else could figure out. He also, he's the one that established a lot of these uh, symbols. Like, you know what that is, right? Pi. He's the one that came up with pi. What? I mean, they talk about famous, the inventor of pi. Not, not the number, but that symbol. Uh, and quite a few other symbols, summation symbols, and a lot of the mathematics. He was a, this was uh, about the time of our revolution, 17, you know, 18th century. Um, and he was the foremost mathematician. He uh, went on, I think the Bernoullis, he tagged along with them. The Bernoullis went to uh, St. Petersburg, I know. From, they, they were all from Basel. And um, they went to St. Petersburg because this was, uh, who was a Peter the Great was trying to establish the, the, the great um, Russian academy there and, and bring Russia up to kind of the level of intelligence of, of um, Europe, or civil, civilization, I should say. Uh, but that, he was like a generation before or something. And then there was a, who followed him? One of the Catherines, maybe the first one. And, and she was also interested in promoting. So they were hiring all these European um, professors or uh, intelligentsia to come and, and teach at the academy in St. Petersburg. And the Bernoulli brothers went there. And then one of them got a, um, ate a bad fish or something and died. And um, must have been Nick and Daniel lived, and uh, uh, he was actually head of the um, physics department, and he got his buddy um, um, Euler Leinhardt to 
to come and come to St. Petersburg, which, I mean, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> I mean, I came to Michigan, but <laughs> St. Petersburg, look on the map, guys. It's not where you'd think you'd want to go. But he enjoyed it. Somehow, Euler, I mean, he, he must have been one of the, the most cheerful people. Everything, you never heard him writing about how freezing it was. He's just really cheerful. Got married, had 13 kids, seemed to enjoy himself immensely. Um, <laughs> And uh, he eventually, Dan, Daniel got, I forget, too cold and went home to Basel. I think that was the story. It was, it was warmer in Switzerland. If it's warmer in Switzerland, you know, if that looks like the tropics from St. Petersburg. So, um, but, but uh, Bernoulli hung on, or yeah, uh, who's this guy? Not Bernoulli, uh, Euler, stayed there. Um, but the climate kind of changed, not the, not the cold. It stayed cold, but the um, uh, political climate changed. Uh, whoever hired him died. I think it was Catherine the first. Died, and, and the other people were not, he, they started to get this little xenophobic uh, phase, and, and um, they, they kind of suggested he might, might leave, or a lot of people might leave. So he did. He went down to um, Berlin at the invitation of uh, Friedrich, the Gro uh, Frederick the Great, I think, would have been there about that time. This is right about our revolution, probably. Does that seem right? And, and there were, um, that was another court where they were trying to get a lot of intelligent, flashy people. And um, he had gathered up a lot of the, this was you know, just prior to the French Revolution, I think. He had gathered up some of the French uh, Voltaire was there, and all these. I mean, they are so suave, and they, and I mean, look at look, Leonhardt, uh, 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 Euler, was uh, a very simple kind of character. He didn't dress up much. He spoke in a. I mean, if you've ever heard how the Swiss speak, <laughs> I met the first time I met somebody that that uh, spoke Swiss, uh, Switzerdeutsch. Um, I didn't speak German very well, and I was in with a group of, of other students, and, and uh, a lot of them were, were different nationalities. They were French, and they were uh, Italians, and they were uh, this one guy that was Swiss, and I was American, and none of us were native German speakers. And we were, you know, this was a program, it was at AS to trying to learn a little German. And of the group, my German was pretty bad, but there was one guy whose German was worse than mine. And this was this, this, I didn't know where he was from. I couldn't understand where he was from because he told me like three or four times and I couldn't understand him. And, and uh, I, you know, so you kind of empathize with the people who are kind of at your level. You kind of get along with them. So this guy and I uh, hit it off real well together. And after about a month, I finally figured out that he was from, uh, he kept saying, Switzer, Switzer, Switzer. What? What the heck? Where is this? I thought it was Siberia or something. I don't know where this was. Is is uh, Switzerland, and um, the Swiss have such an accent. It's a beautiful accent, actually. But I I was just a sound. That means he's a native German speaker. He was the one that was a native German speaker, <laughs> and uh, his accent was so incredible. I I thought he couldn't speak German. So <laughs> whatever. But uh, anyway. But uh, so compared to Voltaire. Uh, I guess uh, Leonhardt was not really impressive to the um, Friedrich the Great. And uh, in fact, he had this problem with his eye. Uh, it fell out, I think. <laughs> so they kind of called him a cyclops. And he kind of wander around and mumble to himself and laugh occasionally. And, I don't <laughs> and so they decided he was more or less crazy and wrote him off. And, um, but it didn't seem to bother him. He went on. He was like publishing. He, he, I think about that period, lost his sight in his other eye, so he was totally blind, and this didn't seem to bother him in the bit. He said, well, I mean, so I got a few assistants. He had, had five GSIs, and he just dictated everything, all his thoughts to them, and he became more prolific because he could, you know, have five of them writing simultaneously as he was <laughs> dictating these different articles, and he published like 60, 70 books as a, of all, I mean, if you, a huge volumes of, of, uh, of work. He was the, uh, 
premier for decades, centuries, the uh, mathematician source of mathematics. Um, anyway, oh, let's see. Let's not talk about Euler forever. But he also, I think he eventually went back. Let's see, where'd he go? Yeah, Friedrich, Friedrich uh, decided he was, just couldn't, uh, couldn't get along with him, and uh, he went back. By this time, things had improved in, in uh, St. Petersburg, and he went back there um, and settled down, had a, had a good time. Uh, unfortunately, his house burned down. That was pretty catastrophic, but he got out alive. All his, all his papers were burned and made some comment like, well, they're all up here. <laughs> no problem. And he dictated them all back out again. <laughs> you know, <laughs> these people writing stuff down. Um, yeah, and and he, yeah, uh, unendless uh, uh, achievements. And he eventually died in St. Petersburg um, of laughter, which I think is true, too. I think it's true. I don't know. Some things I have read may not be true. Um, Anyway, and he, and he developed this. This is the, this is the uh, buckling equation. Uh, this is the load, the critical load, at which a column ba buckles. And it's determined by its elasticity. This is uh, Young's modulus, the material stiffness, times the area, times pi squared, over what's called the slenderness ratio squared, this KL uh, over R. K is a, is a constant, the L is the length, and R is the uh, radius of gyration, which is a, uh, oh, is right there, is a, it's a constant that includes the area and the uh, uh, moment of inertia. So you've got a, this is describing the cross section. The bigger, uh, the stiffer it is, the bigger this number gets. So in the stiff direction, and I, I mean, A presumably is staying constant, constant de depending on how you do this. So if I look at uh, uh, the moment of inertia, uh, I mean, the uh, radius of gyration in this direction versus this direction, it follows the same as the moment of inertia. The moment of inertia is stronger this way, it's weaker this way, right, the stiffness. So the stiffer direction is, is stronger. So the bigger the bigger R is, the stiffer it is, okay? And since R is in the uh, denominator of the slenderness ratio, the stiffer it is, the less slender it is. So in, let's see how we can express this. Hey, get out of there. Um, in this direction, this column is less slender. In this direction, it's more slender. It's the same height, but, but look, it's smaller this way, right? It's uh, more slender. It is slender this way. And this way, it's fatter. It's less slender, even though the, the height is the same. The, 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 um, but the height does also play into it. If this thing were uh, perfectly square, uh, the higher it would be, the more slender it would be, right? The longer. So those two things relate together to form, that's just our, our common definition of slenderness, right? It's a combination of the, the thickness and the height. And the thinner it is, the more slender it is. The higher it is, the more slender it is. And that's, that's uh, expressed in, whoops, in this. The higher it is, uh, the, the, the bigger this, the more slender this is. The more, uh, <laughs> let's see, the, the narrower it is, this number gets lower, so that drives the, this total number up. So we, that's, that's slenderness. And slenderness then <clears throat> is in the, the denominator here, so the more slender it is, the less load it carries. In fact, you get a, uh, when you graph this equation, you can graph it for um, that slenderness. Uh, and let's say for uh, that p crit, you get a you get a graph that that looks something like this. It's asymptotic to both uh, both axes. This will go on. So in both directions it goes. Now, <clears throat> in in uh, 
truth or limits in either direction. I mean, if this goes on, and this, this may not uh, actually come down to it, but at some point, it buckles, it fails. So it, it's, although you might get a number out there, if it's so slender, at some point a slenderness is reached where the, the member fails. The same thing happens in the other direction. Uh, at some point there's a cap here. Uh, the material would crush. So this would be uh, fails <laughs> in, oops, that's supposed to be an N, in, in buckling. And this one fails in crushing. Right? That would be that way, and that would be that way. So in here, uh, actually, this is also this is also failing in buckling. This is this would be the uh, the safe zone in here. It would be that area. <coughs> um, let's see. What else can we say about that? You can also write it in terms of stress. Right? This is the same equation. If you put P over A. I mean, uh, hmm. well, if you bring the A over here, divide out the A, right, that would be P over A, that would give this, and then you get this equation, right? That's in terms of stress. And that you can relate to a, a, a critical stress. This is the way um, it's usually used, I guess. I mean, this, this gives you a force, but since we usually, uh, in allowable stress design, we usually relate things to the stress of the material, the stress capacity. There's a critical stress, critical buckling stress uh, that you can calculate and or find experimentally.